Okay, this is uh, <clears throat> Logic Design, uh, second lecture uh, for the uh, uh, the 26th of August. Uh, welcome. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we'll get started. Um, so I'm going to pick up where we left off. I want to say a couple of housekeeping things first. First, let me uh, let me bring up the syllabus. I'll, here, I'll shrink this down uh, and maybe even a little bit more. And then slide it around here just a little bit. And then I'll bring up the syllabus. So you can see this is the uh, week one. We already had the first day. Today is the second day, August 26th. So a couple of things. So um, uh, go ahead and uh, do your little introduction. Um, for the introduction survey, really, you can uh, you can really just write a little para paragraph that describes yourself. The kind of, you know, where you grew up, went to school, your interests, sports you did, um, you know, clubs, any activities, things you're interested in. And, uh, and go ahead and post it. I'll show you where I want you to do that. So if we go here, and this is the, this is the, our course, um, 2513 Fall 2020. And you go down here to Course Management, click on Course Tools, open it up, go down to um, Discussion Board, click on that, and then click on this one link, and there's a forum, Meet Your Classmates. And you can, you can just post it here. And I think to post it, I think all you have to do, let's see, I'm not really sure. I don't know if you just post uh, let's see uh, so search display hmm oh okay oh here it is post your post your introduction survey here and you can just uh, put it right there and go ahead and just type it in uh, let's see So, so subject, um, so that's my intro. Since two thousand one. Since the fall of 2001, and um, I don't know. For now, I'm not going to put anything else in for me. Uh, so uh, submit, and so then that's published. There you go. And right. And I guess all you had to do was perfect. It's a little confusing what you have to do to post it. But anyway, so hopefully you guys saw that, and you can do the same thing. I've already forgotten how I did it. <laughs> how did I do it? But anyway, I don't need to post again. Okay, so back to um, meet your classmates. So discussion board, click on this, uh, meet your classmates. And then I think I just clicked on it, and then it puts me here, and then um, post. Uh, I think I just said okay. Um, forum. Maybe I just do that. Crud. Total post. No, I give up. Um, what did I do to get that? In there. Well, I don't know. Oh, 
Okay, you just you click on create thread. Okay, got it. All right, so you just click on create thread and you can add your post to this. And again, the way you get there, you go down here to um, to course tools. You click on it. You open it up. And when you open up course tools, wherever it went, tools. No, oh my God. Here we go. Down here, course tools. And then you go down to discussion board. There, there. Click on it. Uh, click on this click on create and you can put in your post all right that's got it all right okay uh, so that's where you can post your uh, your uh, introduction survey um, so again the uh, videos the first video is here this video will be posted here it's not the video it's the YouTube link of course because you can't post videos anymore uh, and then um, Right underneath that is the uh, is the uh, quizzes associated with lectures for F20. Uh, some of these, most of these links you guys can't see, uh, which declutters it for you. Click on this, and uh, and then here's the first test. Uh, make sure you get all the tests done by Saturday midnight. So the Friday one, you have to make sure you do it on Friday or Saturday before midnight. These you have, you know, the rest of the week to do them. All right. That pretty much shows all this. The, the link for the quiz for this video will be in that same page, and the YouTube link for this video will be in this page, in this folder. All right, <clears throat> I think that's it. Um, so let me, yeah, that's another interesting thing, which I'm hopefully going to save here. I'll do a bookmark to that. Now, I will get rid of it. And then done there's my mail okay fine so we're done with that here's the uh, so back to this back to the schedule okay so um, so here we are August 25th today we're supposed to do the pretest I will hopefully have it uh, posted so you can take it but if I don't get it posted today uh, so you can take it on Wednesday then that's okay you can take it tomorrow or Friday or Saturday um, I might even leave it up through the following week, but I want everybody to take it, and um, so I'll probably leave it up till everybody's taken it. Um, you don't get graded; it's just for the ABET purposes. But I would like you to do it uh, this week if you possibly can. Okay, and I right now it is not posted. I have to convert it from a written form to an online form, which I will do, and uh, I'll get it posted. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, remember. You should start work on homework one, and at some point I will have that video out so you can review. I'll give you some hints on how to do that. And um, and uh, so yeah, and this will be this this will be video two. We'll be talking about binary arithmetic code, switching algebra, definition of digital, a bunch of other things. And uh, so we're going to go through finish going through the slides. All right, so I think that's all I wanted to say with respect to that. So let me pop this up. Um, and there we are. And then here I am. And yeah, all right. So, and I, I'm going to shrink myself down a little bit more. I'll scoot myself right over here. And I will turn this a little bit more and down. And now, hopefully you can see me and maybe I'll even make it just a little bit more all right that's not too bad and I think that's far enough over there that I can that it'll be off the slide okay so definition digital I'm I'm gonna go through this a little faster than I normally do because I I, I think it tends to bore students a little bit but I want you to understand uh, the fundamental concept of what digital is all about and that fundamental concept is it's quantized now, what do I mean by quantized? A good example of quantized is music. Music is a perfect example because, for the most part, music is quantized. We have uh, uh, when we when when a composer composes a piece, uh, he uses whole notes, half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, thirty-second notes, maybe uh, maybe sixty-fourth notes. That's it. Uh, I don't 
you know, 128th notes are not really ever used. And so the point is that that no note, there's no such thing as a uh, as a as a 175th note or a 1223rd note. Uh, I mean, in theory, I guess you could have those, but uh, but no composer wrote, writes in those, and they're useless, really. So music is quantized. The note is either a whole note, a half note. So the note either lasts for the whole measure, uh, half the measure, for one beat of the measure, assuming it's, say, 4-4, a four, four, uh, 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 half of a beat, a quarter of a beat, a sixteenth of a beat, or a thirty-second of a beat. And that's pretty much it. And uh, if you play the music back on uh, using a MIDI synthesizer, MIDI file, it it will it will only play those notes. It won't play notes of other durations. If you type, uh, if you play into a MIDI synthesizer from a keyboard, you get to set the level at which you quantize. So you can tell the MIDI synthesizer make the smallest note, the shortest note, make it no, make it a 32nd note, or maybe even make it a 16th note. So when you're playing, if you happen to hold the key down for a little more than a 16th or a little less than a 16th, it's still going to give you a 16th, unless you hold it down for a 16th and a half and, uh, and a little over that, in which case it'll convert it into an eighth note. So it forces the notes into these uh, quantities. Now, in in music, we do allow we do allow dotted notes uh, and things like that, but and we tie notes together. We do weird things, but the concept here is that you force the the duration of a note is quantized. It is limited to just a small set of of lengths of time, and that's the same way that's the same way that a digital system is set up. We we only allow we we force whatever real world quantity might be out there into a bin uh, that is that is an arbitra is arbitrarily sized. So if you have, for instance, you set aside eight bits of room, then you can only have 256 different uh, values in that bin. That's it. Whereas in an analog world, we we the analog world could exist as a voltage. And that voltage, say, uh, could vary from zero to five. So, so the voltage can't be a million volts. It can only be zero volts or five volts. But it can also be any value between those two. So, in theory, it could be 1.5563282 volts. But realistically, we probably don't have the instrumentation to actually measure it to that arbitrarily uh, level of precision. So, what we do, in, so, so, so usually in the analog world, we only maybe get a few significant figures, maybe three. Um, in the digital world, we can actually have an arbitrary number of significant figures. We just have to set more bits, but they may not mean much because our measuring system may not be that accurate. And that's a whole discussion of, of precision and accuracy, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit here in a, just a minute. But the point is that we um, that we that that we force our signal. Into, uh, into little bins, and we only set aside an arbitrary number of those bins, usually a power of two, based on how many bits we have in, in, the, in the word that we're going to use to store the information in. Uh, so if we have a 32-bit word, we can have, we can have, uh, we can have 4 billion uh, bins. If we have a 16-bit word, we can have 65,000 bins. If we have an 8-bit word, we can have 256 bins and so forth. It's just the power of two. So that's what it means to be quantized. Now, there, there's some serious misconceptions that grow out of this. People think, well, if, anal if an analog value can, say, vary between 0 and 5, and the digital value can vary between 0 and 5, but in the digital world, say we set aside, let's say we set aside 8 bits, so our value can only, we only can have 256 values between 0 and 5. 0 would be 0 and 255 would be uh, 255 would be 5 volts uh, and then 120 120 uh, 128 yeah 128 would uh, represent uh, uh, 2.5 volts and so forth and uh, 
so that is how we do digital. So you think, well, gosh, if in analog the, the value can vary between 0 and 5 continuously, isn't it more accurate? And the answer is, well, no, it depends on on your digital system and your and your sensors and your ability to convert from analog to digital. But in the end, uh, there's always noise in the analog world. And uh, so even though you can you can think that that signal could be any any value between zero and five, including one with you know many many decimal places, like two point three six four two five you know and on and on. The truth is you really can't measure it to that level of accuracy, and because of the noise that will be in the environment, and the noise is probably down around a tenth of a volt or so. Anything with all those extra decimals on it is actually very meaningless. But in the digital world, when we first measure the signal and we convert it into the digital world, we, st we do have to deal with noise there, assuming that it starts out as an analog signal. But once we convert it into a digital value, then we can protect our digital value from any effects of noise forever. We can, we can make sure that that digital value is always preserved perfectly. We can do that in a lot of different ways. We have uh, error correcting codes. Uh, we have all sorts of ways of doing this. We can store it in multiple places. Um, we can store it. We can we can have backup copies of it and things like this. But but we have the ability to preserve the the accuracy of that of that signal once we capture that value and turn it into digital. We may have had noise play a role before then, but after then noise can be completely shut out. Whereas in an analog world, we maybe charge a capacitor up to a certain voltage, and that's how we remember it. But then when we try and sense that voltage off that capacitor, a little bit's going to leak off over time. A, a little bit's going to, uh, there's going to be a little noise when we try and measure it. Uh, so in the analog world, we're always dealing with noise. Noise is always screwing up our ability to keep, to keep per it perfectly the data that we've collected. It's always going to mess it up. Our data is always going to degrade when it's stored in an analog manner. And we can never guarantee that we can, that if we get a problem with the data, that we, we can have an error correcting code that tells us there was a problem and we can fix it. Whereas in the digital world, we can do that. Okay, so that I think I, that's really the point I want you to get. That in the digital world, we can qu we quantize things. We force them into little bins. And once we get them into the bins, there's enough, there's, it's very rare that there's enough noise to bump it from one bin to another. And if there is, we, we have ways of detecting that it jumped from one bin to another and fixing it. All right, so let's just see a few silly examples here. Um, so in analog world, physical quantities are allowed to vary continuously over an entire range of values. But in the digital world, we still vary over a, a range. Even in the analog world, our ranges are limited. We don't have infinite voltages. We don't have, you know, about, so we still have reasonable ranges that we have to live within. But this, the signals do vary continuously. However, we can only read them to certain amounts of accuracy. So a glass thermometer with a column of mercury that goes up and down is one example of an analog measuring device. Uh, a standard speedometer where the needle goes up and down as we go faster and slower is another analog uh, display, if you will. But when, when, we, uh, when, when we convert those to digital displays, then we, we sort of take away some of the air and reading them, right? But with the glass thermometer, uh, you, you can say, well, the column varies continuously from, say, you know, say a fever thermometer from 95 degrees to 107 degrees. But how accurately can we actually read that? And, and so, so we are still limited uh, by our ability to read them. Whereas in the digital world, once we have it in a digital format, uh, we can display those digits as big as you want. And even so it's visually challenged, can still see what, what that number is. Or we can actually announce it in, by uh, uh, synthesizing an audio announcer that tells us what the digits are. We consider our signals in the analog world continuous functions between some allowable maximum and minimum, some reasonable limits. But, but we have hard limits on precision because of noise and because of our ability to translate it from the analog world uh, into a reading. All right. 
precision versus accuracy. I want you to kind of get this, uh, and I'm going to show you an example. Uh, precision is the ability to read a value to a certain number of decimal places, uh, or to a certain level of accuracy. Uh, accuracy is the degree to how close a reading comes to the actual value. So, uh, and then validity is when the reading is both accurate and valid, or accurate and precise. Now, really what precision really means is every time you say read a thermometer, how close to the how 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 close to the previous reading is your current reading assuming the temperature hadn't changed. Let's say the temperature stays the same, you read the thermometer once and you say you get 98.7. Then you read it again and this time you get 98.4. And the next time you read it, you get 98.9. And the next time you read it, you get 98.0. And the next time you read it, you get 98.6. And you can see we're, we're varying it. We're seeing a fair amount of variation. Every time we read it, we get a little different reading, even though theoretically the temperature didn't change. That's, that's, that, would be, that would be a measure of our precision. Now let's say the, the actual temperature is actually uh, 98.6. So with all those readings, you can see we, we weren't very accurate. Only once did we get 98.6, and the other times we got readings that were off by, you know, uh, several tenths of a degree. And we can have a reading that's, so uh, a better way to do this is look at a target. Um, I'm going to, I think I put that in here. Uh, let's see, yeah, let me, let me go back and get that. Um, I will fix this. Okay, so um, so here's an example of an analog and a digital gauge, and then in just a second I'll uh, show. If you look at this, this this is apparently oil pressure gauge. Uh, this is I don't know. Pretend it's oil pressure. I think it says ten, uh, times 10 degrees Fahrenheit, but whatever. Uh, notice we have a needle here that moves around. How accurately can you read this? Here we have digits 250. So clearly over here, there's no doubt that you can read it to uh, to the nearest integer. Whereas here, uh, that's zero. That's that looks like well, this is twenty. So each one of these is five. So that'd be five, ten, fifteen. Uh, sorry, each one of these is uh, two and a, uh, four. Each one of these is four. So four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty. So, so, so it looks like that would be four, but it could easily be three point seven. It could easily be, you know, and and it'd be the needle is thick enough to cover probably probably two numbers, so it's pretty hard to read this to anything. Even you, it's maybe hard to read this gauge to single digit accuracy, because I I I'm, I don't think I can necessarily tell the difference between one, two, three, and four reliably. Okay, whereas over here clearly I can tell the difference between one, two, three, and four. Uh, no problem, because that 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 ones place digit is going to be easy to read. Now, so which one of these digits, which one of these gauges is more precise? Which one's more accurate? Well, so let's look at precision and accuracy first again, so we can kind of understand them, because the, the definitions are kind of confusing. But this this really does help me. Okay, so we have four targets. Now, notice in this target, our shot group is really close together but we're not on target. This is an example of very precise, but not particularly accurate. Now, in this shot group, we're, we're really clustered around the center of the target, but we don't have a super tight group. So it's not super precise, but by golly, we've got the center bracketed. So it, it, it has pretty high accuracy. So if, if we were shooting at a person, this would do the trick. This would be great shooting but we'd miss the person maybe and then uh, this one would be terrible not pr not accurate and not precise either one and this is of course what we're looking for it's precise because we've got a tight group and it's accurate because it's right on the target and this is what we call uh, valid all right so so that's that's the concept okay so here's another example Look at this thermometer over here versus this one. This reads in centigrade 37.0. Uh, so this one, this one reads 
centigrade on this side, Fahrenheit on this side. So, so this is zero. Each one of these dot dashes is two degrees. So two, four, six, eight, ten. Two, four, six, eight, twenty. Two, four, six, eight, thirty. Um, how accurately can you read that? I mean, can you read it for sure to, to plus or minus one degree? Maybe. What about to plus or minus 0.1? No way. There's no possible way you can do that. So clearly, this, this is going to be read much more accurately than this. So even though this column of mercury can vary continuously from something like, you know, minus 30 or 40 degrees all the way up here to whatever it goes up to, 120 or something, even though it varies continuously, and you might think, well, it can it can have any value in between any of these. So it could be it could be uh, it could be you know 37.1567. Well, it could, but you can't read that. The best you can do might be to read 37, and even then, you certainly can't read much difference between 37.1, 37.2, 37.3. Maybe you can get a, you probably can't even get a reliable half degree in there. So you, you may be reading to something like 0.6 or 7 of a degree, if even that accurately. It's just not very accurate. Or I should say precise. It's not very precise. You just can't read it the same. I, like I can look at this. My first time I look at it, I might say that is 9, 9.8 degrees or something. Next time I look at it, I might say, well, that's 10 degrees. Then next time I look at it, I might say it's 9.5. I don't know. What is it? I don't really know. It's very hard to read it. Okay, over here, I'm going to read it the same every time. So it's easy to get very high precision from my digital thermometer. And that's always true with digital. In, in the digital world, precision is not a problem. We can have as, the precision can be as perfect as we want it to be. What we, what we can have trouble with is accuracy. How do we know that, that the temperature this thing measured was exactly 37.0 degrees? It, it, it might have been off a little bit, right? We don't know that. And so since we don't know, since in this case, say, we don't really know, uh, it's a little hard to assess how accurate this is going to be. There's no guarantee that our digital value is accurate. Uh, but we can guarantee the precision. Because once we've got that value, we're never going to, we can preserve it. Now we can do other things to help with accuracy, but but that's but but that's a whole other discussion. I don't want to go there. Okay, so keep moving. So in the current world we live in, uh, and this has really changed. Even when I started giving these lectures, there were still quite a few things done in analog because it was cheaper. That's not true anymore. Back when I first started giving this lecture, um, we were still mostly most a lot. Well, I don't know, maybe. Ten years before I started, say, almost all of our oscilloscopes were analog scopes, and now they're all digital. Uh, and uh, many things have changed. So uh, as time has gone on, we've we've now gotten to the point where there's there's almost no place where there's an advantage for the analog. And the only reason we deal with analog is because the real world we live in generates analog data for the most part, that we then have to turn into digital data. And, uh, and so our, our, the front end of our sensors are typically analog sensors. And then we change that analog value into a digital value in various ways. Uh, one of the ways we call it, we use what's called an analog to digital converter. And there's all sorts of ways to make those. They come in all shapes and sizes, speeds and accuracies and precisions and whatnot. But in these days, Digital has almost all the advantages. Some of the major advantages of digital are that uh, because we can describe, we can program it with software in many cases, it's very flexible to change what it's doing. We can have multi-purpose blocks that can be reprogrammed and connected to other blocks, and we can have just a rapid change from, from one configuration to another with a digital piece of equipment. Uh, digital is often very reliable. Uh, it usually continues to work very robustly for many, many years, and usually uh, it, it, the parts that fail on it are typically things like the power supply, kind of an, the analog parts of it. And so our mathematical operations in digital can have unlimited precision. We can set aside as many bits as we want, uh, as we can afford anyway, 
to do a mathematical calculation and we will preserve every single or almost every almost the complete precision of that calculation can be preserved. Now, there are limits, but they're not very many, and even those with more money we can more or less overcome. In the analog world, we used to do mathematical calculations with, with uh, operational amplifiers in, in, uh, in, in analog computers, and the best we could do is maybe three digits of, of, of significance, and past that we, we had to throw in the towel because you you, there was so much noise past that level, there was no way to, uh, to have any more precision than that. So there were real limitations of precision. Those are not there in the digital world. Um, in a digital device, generally the inputs are related to the outputs in a very deterministic way. Uh, this is, in the analog world, there's just so much noise, it's kind of hard to say this. Uh, they may be related, but it, it's, not, it's not hardwired in a deterministic way. It's 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 also it's affected by noise and in the digital world we can control noise the only noise we maybe can't really control is uh, a, uh, an, an ele a huge uh, electromagnetic pulse set off by a by a nuclear weapon that may be enough to overwhelm any digital system uh, and really screw it up but most normal noise can be definitely handled okay uh, there's really no advantages of analog anymore uh, and once you build an analog system, it's very hard to change it in any major way. Uh, you almost have to start over. Uh, some of the real high power things uh, can still uh, be sort of analogish. Um, and most of our transducers, microphones, um, um, light photoresistors, um, uh, phototransistors, um, uh, pressure sensors. Um, a lot of a lot of our a lot of our sensors are are still uh, analog in nature. Now, a push button is really not analog. That's a pretty digital input. A shaft encoder with with rings on it. Uh, that's actually a pretty digital. Uh, interface. So there are some interfaces that are pretty digital and now most of our analog interfaces have a conversion to digital right at the interface and then the signal we send back is actually a digital signal. So we have a little analog transducer, maybe we even amplify a little bit and then the first thing we do is convert it into a digital signal and it stays digital the rest of the way. Um, the one thing you can say about an analog display that's hard to do with a digital display uh, if we go back to our, our our needle here, you can see this needle here. If the oil pressure suddenly started to go up very rapidly, you can see you get a real sense of the first derivative by uh, by looking at how fast that needle is moving, and well, even and even the second derivative, uh, you can see if it starts to accelerate. Whereas uh, with this display, they put this little row of lights on there, and and that is an attempt to give you. Uh, the some some first and second derivative information which you won't get as the numbers change when the numbers change it's real hard to tell what's going on with a digital display uh, so when you wanna when you wanna have that first and second derivative information it, it really does help to have um, really does help to have uh, a, a an analog gauge yeah, somewhere in the mix all right so again analog limited number of significant digits, noise and precision are big problems, and um, that's a huge contrast with digital, where, where we can have really unlimited precision, only limited by how much we spend on our device, and as cheap as memory is, it's not much of a limitation actually anymore, and uh, because we have stored programs, our digital devices can be extremely agile and reconfigurable. Uh, a microprocessor can be set up one second to measure pressure in a well and two seconds later it can be measuring uh, radiation from the sun or you can reconfigure it again and have it do both things at the same time. It's just crazy uh, how powerful our digital hardware really is. Okay, in this course we're going to uh, we're going to break things down uh, in the whole world of digital we talk about systems and then we talk about logic design and circuits. 
Um, we're this this core. So uh, digital systems design. We're talking more at the systems level. Logic design. That's what this course is about. And we're talking more about about uh, about logical blocks and their connections. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about state state machines in the third part of the course, uh, which we call sequential design. But the the bulk of the course is just uh, logic design, and we we modify we we uh, represent that with this with this this box concept. Okay, I was going to say black box, but this one's white, so term doesn't fit. But in this in this case, we have some number of inputs. In this case, three, but we could have just one or two or whatever. We, we could have a hundred. We have some number of inputs. And then we have some number of outputs. For many of our proje project problems, we only have one output, but we could have two or three or four. For for most of your design problems, you're going to have uh, seven or f or at least four outputs, or maybe five. Uh, well, usually four or seven, something like that. We have this switching network, and the way we're we're going to model things by we have s the inputs are changing, and when the inputs change, the switching network responds and generates new outputs. And in the first, in the mid part of the course, we're going to do strictly combinational design, where whatever the inputs are at the moment, minus a small delay to let the switching network respond and settle, then the outputs represent the current state of the inputs. Always, and it doesn't matter what the inputs were previously, whatever they are now determines the outputs. That's a combinational network. On the other hand, when we get to the last part of the course, when we do sequential networks, then what we will see is that um, our our inputs, uh, our current inputs, are only part of the story. We also need to know something about some degree of previous inputs, and those previous inputs will have put our switching network into one of n number of states. Uh, the number of states may be very large in a very complex system, and it may be very small in a simple sequential design. But, but some, some, we will be in some state based on previous inputs. And then we have the current inputs, and the combination of the current inputs and the present state will determine our outputs, not just the present inputs. So that's the difference. That's a sequential design or a state machine, and the other one is a combinational design. The state machine, or the combina or the sequential design, those always have a, a clock and some kind of memory elements to remember what state we're in. A combinational design doesn't have a clock and it doesn't have any memory. Okay, but of course the building blocks of our sequential designs and our state machines are always a bunch of combinational design blocks. Okay, um, so. This is what I just described. Combinational design and sequential design. Combinational design only depends on current inputs and no historical information. Sequential design depends on prior inputs, current inputs. And of course it requires more logic. It, and it requires some kind of memory, which we usually get by feedback. And usually it has a clock as well to synchronize. Okay. Um, so, uh, when we want to design what's in the black box, we have some inputs, we have a black box, we have some outputs. We we usually start with this uh, uh, a a way to describe what the output should be for a given set of inputs, and we call this this chart, this description, a truth table. And uh, we're going to see a lot of truth tables in this course. When we get to sequential design, our truth tables get a little more complicated, and we don't call them truth tables anymore. We call them state tables. Uh, one of the things that we often that, that's often important to do is to take is to take a truth table and write the actual hardware gates that would implement that truth table, and. We're going to show you how to do that, and that's one of the things you're going to learn in this course. When we when we write that implementation, initially we may have more terms in it than we really need, so we would like to be able to simplify it, and we have some tools for doing that, which you're going to learn. 
Um, but the interesting thing, when I started teaching this course, uh, simplifying these things was considered a very important thing to do. But uh, that importance is decreasing. And that is because, uh, in some cases, we don't need to simplify them. We just implement them as is. Uh, but in other cases, we really, really, really do need to simplify them. Like when we make an integrated circuit, well, there we want to we want to simplify our logic as much as possible, so that our real estate on the chip will be as small as possible, and we can get the greatest possible yields uh, from each wafer of silicon that we uh, make our chips on. So if our chips are big, then they 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 cost more money to make. If they're really really small then they're a lot cheaper. And how simplified our equations are uh, does have a fair amount to do with um, whether or not uh, how much surface area we need for our integrated circuit that implements them. Okay. Um, in the old days, since we implemented everything with gates, we were always having to simplify things. Nowadays, we only really simplify. We only really need to really simplify things when we're making an integrated circuit. For most of the other things we do, programming, uh, programming programmable hardware like a FPGA or something like that, we don't really have. We don't have to. We don't have to kill ourselves to simplify it. But you still need to learn the simplification techniques for building integrated circuits. So we're still going to cover them. They're just not as important as they used to be. Okay. So states in a digital system. So this is not to be confused with our state machine. What I'm talking about here is that we are, we're going to use, we're, we're going to have all of our digital devices basically are going to, are going to be in either uh, one of two states, true or false, or sometimes we'll say zero to one. Now it is true that your, your jump drive you have in your pocket it currently uses memory that's four state and maybe some some's three state. So we we're seeing uh, we're seeing this uh, this wall of the two-state world start to have some cracks in it, and maybe someday we will be designing in not in binary anymore. We'll be designing in in a you know a quad uh, for you know base four language, uh, and that's going to change a lot of things. It's going to really be a dramatic revolution, uh, and maybe it'll never happen because there's going to be a lot of pushback. To change everything we know to go to a different number of states um, or to go to a different base but right now we're in we're in a base two world where where everything in our digital world is either zeros or ones or we really it's better to think of it as true and false with zero being false and one being true um, in most of our digital thing almost everything we do digitally we really don't when we say you know the output is f equals zero we're really saying f is false, and when we say f equals one, we're saying f is true. And uh, when we add true and true together, we get true. We don't get two. We get true. So if we consider true one, if we have if we add one with one, we don't get two. We still just get one. Okay, sorry. I know that's confusing. All right. So this is one. This is another part of the one of the disciplines of our, of, of our design that everything we do is going to be two state zeros and ones all right we're gonna we're gonna cover some physical devices multiplexers uh, 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 decoders read-only memories uh, we're not going to talk much about diodes and transistors and integrated circuits but those are obviously other physical devices and from all of these devices pretty much uh, we can use transistors as non-digital devices we can use them as amplifiers and use them and the, bias them to be worked in the linear part of their characteristic curves. But uh, but for the most part, uh, we're going to use them in our, in our integrated circuits. Our CMOS transistors are, are basically either going to be in cutoff or full saturation, which means they're either going to be zeros or ones. Um, and because of this, it was an obvious choice to use a base two number system in our digital design. So that's what we did. We're also going to talk a little bit about hardware description language. I'll get into this later. Uh, and there, are, there, we're going to mention a couple of them. There's uh, the two prominent ones used throughout the world right now are Verilog and VHDL. Uh, VHDL stands for 
very high speed integrated circuit hardware description language. So the V is an acrostic and HDL is an acrostic, so it's an acrostic within an acrostic. Uh, in the US, Verilog has gotten uh, the most play, I think, at this point, and it's pretty much used for all for all the integrated circuits to get built in foundries in the US, pretty much Verilog's the language that's used. The the big um, chip that Intel would put out or AMD, very long files make that chip. Um, and we're going to look, we're going to take a cursory look at hardware description languages later in the course. Okay, now we're going to start the binary math part. Let's see how we're doing on time. So we're at 45 minutes, so we have a few more minutes to go here. So I'll get started on this. Um, so binary math is uh, is sort of the meat and potatoes of uh, digital design. But we don't think of this so much in terms of, you know, adding up numbers and that sort of thing. We can do math in binary too. What I'm really talking about here is the logic applied to it. All right. So we use the base two number system. Uh, base two numbers have a special relationship to to octal and to hexadecimal. Octal is base eight. Hex is base 16. They also have a special relationship to base four and base 12. Uh, but we're not going to use those particularly. Um, and we're not even going to use octal. It used to be important, it's not anymore. Uh, the two important number systems uh, for the digital world are base 2 and hex. Hex is hexadecimal, of course, uh, so binary and hex, and uh, we obviously still think in terms of the decimal system. All the, all the math you do in your head is always in decimal. Uh, you're even doing decimal when you do base 2 math, really. Um, and so you really can only do decimal math. Uh, we, we, you've never memorized the times table for a base seven number system. You don't know what those times tables are. Uh, it would take, you'd have to go back through the fourth grade and learn the times tables or wherever you learn that. Uh, so we have to do our math in base 10. The computer, however, can think just fine in base two, and that's what it does. So how do these number systems work? What does a base mean? So it all starts with this decimal point. Now, in our other bases, it's not a decimal point anymore because decimal refers to 10. So it's just going to be called a point. Okay? You could call it a binary point. You could call it a hex point. But I'm just going to call it a point. So here you have a decimal number. Now, sometimes to represent base 10, we'll put a subscript on the number. So this is base 10, 953.78. What is this? Why does this 953.78? How does that work? Why is that? It's because each one of these digits is multiplied by a power of our base. Since base is 10, we start at the, at the point and we work left and right. Working left, we start with a with an exponent of zero. So the three is multiplied by t t ten, times 10 to the zero. The five is multiplied by 10 times to the one. The nine is multiplied by 10 time, times 10 to the two. And if we had another digit, it would be 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, and so forth. If we start at the point and we go right, the first digit is multiplied by 10 to the minus 1, and the next by 10 to the minus 2, and so forth. So that's why at 7 tenths and 8 one hundredths. And this is 3 times 1, or 3, 5 times 10, or 50, 9 times 10 squared, or 900. So 900 plus 50 plus 3 plus 7 tenths plus 8 one hundredths makes 953.78. That's how that works. Same thing in our other bases. Um, let's see, I have to do this. So you can see that. So our powers of 2 start at 0 and go up as we move left from the point, And they start at minus 1 and go down as we go from to the right of the point. Other bases look like this. Now, one of the things in, in each base, every base has, let's, so let's say in base 10, that means we need 10 symbols to represent numbers in base 10. What are, what are those symbols? Well, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. In base 2, how many symbols do we need? 2. That's right. And that's why we expropriate from our 10 decimal digits a zero and one. So in a base two number, we never write anything besides zeros and ones. 
in a hexadecimal digit, uh, hexadecimal base 16 number, how many symbols do we need? We need 16. How many do we have? Unfortunately, we only had 10 number symbols, and so we went and stole the first six letters to give us 16 symbols. And, and I think this was a colossal blunder. Uh, only if we'd had the foresight to see how important hex was going to be, we would have come up with six new symbols to represent, the, to round out the 16 we would need. And in fact, it's probably not too late. I, I would encourage you to uh, maybe come up with six new symbols. Maybe we should do this as a class project and submit these. Uh, and uh, because uh, in the Unicode world, we could do this right now uh, because uh, Unicode can cover even emojis. So we could definitely come up with uh, six new number symbols to be used in hex. Why am I complaining about the use of the first six letters? I'll tell you why. There's two, two reasons. One, it, it confuses it with words. So, for instance, the, the word BAD, how, is that bad or is that a hex number? You don't know. Uh, so it's confusing. Whereas one, two, three, there's no doubt that doesn't, that's not a word, it's a number. And I would like to see hex be, uh, have the ambiguity taken out of hex, which is there now. That's one problem. Here's the other problem, and this bugs me even more. When you use the letters, which letters do you use? Because, as we all know, there is a capital A, and there's a, and there's a lowercase a. So which one should we use? How do we know? We don't. So normally... You, when you write software to interpret hex numbers, you have to allow for the A to be either uppercase or lowercase, which complicates your logic. It, and it complicates it significantly. It's not trivial. It's a pain in the butt. And if you had six extra dedicated symbols for the extra hex, uh, for the extra hex symbols that you need, the other six, then you wouldn't have that problem. So you would take away the confusion with words, and you would take away... Uh, the duplicity with more than one, uh, an upper and a lowercase a, an upper and lowercase b, and so forth. And, and it would really be cleaner and nicer. But we're stuck with what we're stuck with, um, unless you want to design that. Okay. So, um, so you can say in octal, 725 is just 7 times 8 squared plus 2 times 8 to the first plus 5 times 8 to the zero, or 5. In hex, uh, we start again at the point. We didn't put a decimal, or we didn't put a fractional portion. I shouldn't say decimal because it that that refers to to, ha to to the decimal number system, base 10. But in hex, base 16. So we start two times 16 to the zero, 16 to the one, 16 to the two, and um, and then you can add. You can find out what 16 squared is and multiply it by 10. Find 16 times three is uh, what 32 48 and then uh, 16 and then uh, 16 to the 1 is 1 16 to the 0 is 1 so that's just 2 so so this is what some of the other bases look like and of course base 2 is the same 2 to the minus 1 2 to the 0 2 to the 1 uh, so the de so the point would be right in between the 0 and the minus 1 and these would be fractional so the first fractional bit in a in a binary then this number here 1 1 1 Point one one, one 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 point one one. That one represents one half. That one represents one quarter. So that's that's uh, fifteen and three quarters. That's what that number is in decimal. Okay. So uh, there's a special relationship between binary and hex, and uh, that special relationship. Uh, comes about because exactly four binary digits can translate directly into one hex digit. So 1111 is 15, and that's F in hex, and uh, 1110 is E, and 1101 is D, 1100 is C, 1011 is B, and 1010 is A. And then the rest of them are pretty straightforward, going all the way down to zero. So you can take four binary bits and you can def directly read a hex number from it. You can't do that with decimal, because uh, because you 
in the four bits you you have 16 possible values and in in three bits you only have seven so three bits is not enough for a decimal number and four is too many so it doesn't fit exactly into four binary bits a decimal number has to be translated into binary by by doing math it's a little more it's kind of laborious okay so one of the things I would like you to do and I'm gonna quit on this I'd like you to take a sheet of paper and write down the four binary bits zero 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 and then underneath that write zero 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 one and so forth all the way up to one 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 you should have sixteen rows when you're done or sixteen numbers 16 binary numbers, the values 0 through 15. Now, remember in in digital and logic design, we and in the whole digital world, we always start with 0. We don't start counting 1 2 3 4, we start counting 0 1 2 3. So always remember your first item is 0. And that's always true. It's true with indexes, it's true with everything. Uh and th and then keep going till you get all the way up to uh, till, till you get all the way up to one zero zero one, which is nine, and then one zero one zero, which is A or ten, one zero one one, which is B, and so forth, all the way up to one 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 one, which is fifteen or F. And make yourself a little table and memorize it. So when you see four bits, you know what that hex value is instantly. Because you need that you need to have this skill. It's not a tough thing to develop, but you need to have this skill uh, if you're going to do did work in the digital world, which you are. So you just need to sit down and memorize it tonight, and then it's done. All right. With that, I'm going to quit. Uh, I hope to get the uh, I hope to get the uh, to post uh, as soon as I can the. Um, Hope to post as soon as I can the uh, prereq quiz and have you take that quiz. It, it's not too many questions, and again, there's no grade. Doesn't your grade does not depend on it, so you don't have to worry about it at all. But I would like you to uh, to be able to get it done. I will also though also I will post on Blackboard uh, where I showed you in in, in the uh, uh, in the logic design um, course. I will post a uh, post lecture test. Quiz, or quiz, a post-lecture quiz for lecture number two, which is this lecture. So be sure you do that quiz. You should look at this video and do the quiz immediately. Uh, but for sure do it before Saturday at midnight. And post your, uh, post your little uh, um, introduction on the, uh, on the bulletin board, or on the discussion board. All right, I think that's it. Uh, and that way everybody can see it. Do you have any questions? So if so, you can. Uh, um, we'll have we'll have a little Zoom help session. Uh, I'll, I'll send out a I'll send out an email to everybody and tell you when it's going to be, because I don't know for sure when it's going to be. Uh, but I will I, I I probably will do it. I may do it tomorrow. I may do it Thursday. We'll see. I'm yeah. I may do it and I may do it in the evening. I don't know. I, I, I'll, I'll put it on. I'll, I'll figure out the best time. And we may move it. It's not necessarily going to always be the same time. Uh, but I will set a Zoom link. You don't have to do it. It's totally optional. But if you have questions, it, it's a better place for you to come than during my office hours, which was kind of crowded uh, on Monday. But you can always come on Monday. Probably probably the traffic there will go down after the, another week or so. All right. With that, we will stop.